Welcome to the 2020 Meet the Press Film Festival at AFI Fest. We're less than a month till the election. And as you can see uh, from these films, there's a lot more on the ballot this time around than just the personalities at the top of each of the tickets. I'm Joe Linkett, business and technology correspondent at NBC News. And I'm so excited to be joined by Kristen Lapis, co-director of Blackfeet Boxing, director Nick Natal, director of Games of Survival, and Anjali Nair, director of Oil and Water. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, say how impressed I was, everyone, by your films. Uh, I watched each of them a couple of times, and I found them to be deeply moving and really bringing to the forefront uh, so much of what we should be discussing more of right now, which is our culture across the U.S. and, and where it stands and where it's going. Um, so I guess my first question is for you, Kristen. I wanted to know as you were putting together Blackfeet Boxing, what inspired you to choose this particular topic of all the things that you could have made a documentary film about? Sure, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I'm amongst such uh, wonderful company, all of the films have been so excellent. So I, I feel really grateful and appreciative. Um, to answer your question, I, I, I'm sure the other filmmakers feel this, this way, but you're inspired by uh, the most unlikely things sometimes. Um, I admit that about two years ago when I started this project, I didn't know much about the missing murdered indigenous women crisis. Um, I, it, you know, it was, um, honestly, fate that brought me to the story. I was coming back from Nepal, uh, where I was directing another film about a female golfer over there. And on the plane, I happened to just put on the film uh, Wind River, uh, which is fictionalized, but it's about a girl that goes missing from a reservation um, in Wyoming. And the film ends with a panel um, that comes up over black. And basically it just says that while there are missing and murdered statistics for every other demographic, none exist for Native American women. Nobody knows how many have gone missing or been murdered. And the statement kind of took my breath away. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and it just stuck with me. I got off the plane and I just started researching this crisis and and how horrible it was in the United States and why it hadn't been covered. Um, it was like the craziest thing ever. You really had to dig to find out information about it. Um, and in my research, it kind of led me to um, a photo essay in the Billings Gazette, Billings, Montana Gazette. And the photo essay was basically um, a reporter out there had captured the images um, in reaction to a young girl named Ashley Loring uh, Heavy Runner having gone missing from the reservation um, out in, in Montana. And um, the images were so tragic, but there was one image that stuck out in my mind. Um, it was two young girls sparring at the Blackfeet Nation Boxing Club. And the, the caption under the photo read, uh, young girls trained in self-defense um, in order to take matters into their own hands. And I just thought there are so many negative stories about this issue, um, but here are the next generation of young girls trying to, to do something about it and to find their voice and to, to really um, try to make a difference. And so um, I'm a producer for ESPN Films and 30 for 30. I went right back to my bosses and I was like, we need to tell this story. It's not Michael Jordan, it's not Lance Armstrong, but these girls are every bit as impressive and we need to share their story. Um, and that's kind of how it all came about. It's, it's fascinating how something like this, something so powerful can come about so organically and even come about from a fictional film like Wind River. And I guess, Nicholas, that really drives, turns me to you here. And I'd like to know, you know, you talk about in the same way that so much of Blackfeet is about survival and the, the concept and the practice of survival. You say that the games of survival are about not just survival itself, but the preservation and advancement. Of, um, of culture. And so I wanted to know a little bit more about how you decided to approach that in the way that you told the story. Because comparing the three films, obviously, it's not, you know, it's all apples and oranges, but the storytelling approach that you took was quite different. And I wanted to know how you decided to tell the story in the way that you did. Yeah, great. I'm really uh, happy to hear you enjoyed the film. Um, Games of Survival started out as a project about just one of the individual subjects. 
Um, so I sought Nick Hansen out, um, who's the character who competed in American Ninja Warrior. Um, and after speaking with him, you know, he kept saying, oh, you should talk to my friend who competes in this game. You should talk to this person. You should talk to my coach from when I was a kid. And I realized that, you know, I shouldn't be telling the story about his experience. I should be telling the story about everyone's experience and how important these games are to the entire community itself. Um, and, you know, it stands as the largest gathering of native people in Alaska. Um, and it really offers them an opportunity to come together and see people that they don't see throughout the year. You know, a lot of these people live in villages all across the state, really far apart with, um, you know, poor access, getting in and out of them. Uh, so it's really important for them to have this one event where they can all get together and, you know, share a common experience. Um, so the more people I talk to, I just realized, wow, you know, this is really important to this group of people. And I, you know, want to get that message across. Anjali, um, watching Oil and Water and watching Chum Chum's story, I, I was so inspired. And I think that it was a story, frankly, that I, and I think many other people are certainly not aware of. And I think that each one of you, yourself included, brought so much light and understanding to things that we really ought to know about. And as a journalist, there's always the uncovered stories, but I felt this is particularly true in your case. And I wonder, how did you come across Chum Chum's story, this nascent women's movement that seems to have really gained momentum uh, recently? And, and what was the context in which you discovered this story and decided to tell it? Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, the reality is that these types of stories are happening everywhere in the world where big business is coming up against indigenous communities and the play out is happening, but it's happening in very, very remote part parts of the world where we don't have access to that information. And so it's very hard for people to participate and for those voices from the ground to come to come up. Um, I had heard about it. Um, I run this little technology project called Timby. This is my backyard. And we had like heard from people in the community that were reaching out through our system to pro bono lawyers for assistance on this. So this really came from the front lines and we work in the, like in the Amazon, we work kind of in 40 countries around the world. Um, but this particular story was really um, one that I, that I felt like I had to go and do something more about because it's a, a, a region of the world that I had been working on uh, for about, you know, the last 12 to 15 years, I've been living in Nairobi. Um, I had made a film in the region before, um, and it felt like it was so close to home, um, and yet it was so far. Like it was all the way up in the northern part of, of Kenya, and I had seen the company's big skyscrapers kind of skyrocket in Nairobi, and it was taking over so much space in this idea of development. And I really wanted to dig in and figure out what that was about. So what you were hearing necessarily in, in the news at the beginning was all this hope of like, you know, it's the same narrative as always that, you know, um, extraction becomes a catch all for all these government services that aren't being provided. So it, it's gonna provide healthcare, it's gonna provide water, it's gonna provide education for people. Um, but what does that actually mean on the ground? And is that the best sustainable solution? And our voices from the communities, in particular women, being heard in that conversation about what is chosen to do and how and why. Um, so it was, it was um, a region that I cared deeply about. These things are happening everywhere. We just don't necessarily know about them. And a desire to kind of tell a story that wasn't necessarily, you know, the, the number one conflict, because usually these, these films really do um, have the voice of the men in the community. So like to take that back and let it be a little bit more nuanced and have it from the perspective of the experience of women and much of their experience is like filtered through the men in their community and seeing what that looks like as another level down was really my intention is, you know, we've heard the, the kind of raw, raw community struggle, but what is it one step further when you look at women who don't even have a voice in their communities to begin with? Do you feel like in that time that you were covering this conflict with Tulo, did it, did you feel like things were improving for the better? It seemed like the communities, the women's voices were amplified and there was a level of, of advancement, but at the same time, it also felt like 
you said that there's these huge companies with massive influence that come in and use the community's resources, either stay and deplete them or, or, or leave. Mm -hmm. How, what, what's the status report that you, you would give us in terms of where these women stand and their voices and their power in the community now? Right. Um, well, I tried to kind of paint that out that this isn't going to be like a, a like it's not going to be a quick resolution by any means. And the the most important thing that can happen throughout this process is that their voices are heard, that they feel legitimacy in those moments, and that they're encouraged to continue to speak out. And that was what was so incredible about Chum Chum is she had such a strong voice, but she's also an elder. So like if you compare her experience as an elder to somebody who's like a young woman who feels all of these things but doesn't feel like they're able to express them. That's what I think the power and the journey can be for those communities so that they have the ability to kind of speak out one level further to their to the men in their community as well as to, to companies. In terms of like how much progress can happen as many of these, you know, situations that are global um, in the last year, you know, Tello has struggled financially a lot because of oil prices, because of the financial decisions that it made in the country and ultimately the decisions and what happens to Tello as a company in the region is going to be much more dependent on those global forces than perhaps the voices of the women on the ground. But if you add the women, those women and the women next door in the next community and the women next door in the next community, that's where I think the real power can be over time. So this particular women's group might not have a voice that kind of gets very far, but it will inspire other people to step out to start the same conversations. And I think that globally, that's what needs to happen to make a difference. Well, it's that power in the larger community. I think that uh, so many people find inspiring about the, the stories, as you say, going up against a company of that size and influence, it, it, it feels and it can be just totally impossible. And I think it's that sense of community that I really felt just as a not an expert of, or f expert film re reviewer that all of you really share in, in the um, in the sort of foundation of your films. And Kristen, I want to know, you know, as, in, in the same sort of vein, you know, what I found so powerful one of the many things in your film was as these young women were training to learn skills, there were these like deeper, super frank conversations, very uncomfortable about the plain acknowledgement that you can be stolen and an out loud conversation. And what was it like to observe those deeply personal moments with the girls? What I wanted to know was, was this already kind of being, these conversations were being had privately in, 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 a family or among the girls and then they were sharing it yet again in in the community there at the training center or was it first time raw saying it out loud moments sure so i mean first of all my reaction to hearing these conversations was i was i was my i was astonished i was honestly astonished by we think of these numbers of these girls that go missing as statistics, but for these young women, these are their friends, these are their sisters, these are people that they have your relationships with. This is their lives and it happens all the time on these reservations. Um, I think what was so special about Frank and the gym and the safe space basically that he created was that a lot of these young girls um, do not talk about it at home. Um, a lot of them endure domestic violence within their households. They deal with drugs and alcohol and other issues at home. Um, and so what was so cool to see was that when they come into the gym, they basically find their voice. And I actually went home with a lot of the girls over the um, span of our filming over the course of the two years. And um, they're very shy. They're very timid when they're in their households. And then they come into the gym and they're finally able to be loud and boisterous and and um, really speak their minds because Frank encourages that in that environment, um, which is so amazing. And as you said, like, no, I did not know a lot of these girls were, were enduring some of the things that they had until they actually said it in their interviews. This wasn't like done, you know, I didn't, no one told me that, you know, um, Serenity's sister had been raped. Um, that was something that she said in the interview and it shocked me um, in the moment that she was willing to reveal that. But it, again, it just goes to Frank's created this safe space where the girls feel like they can say um, and be really honest and truthful. Um, and I think that's what's so special about the gym and that's why we chose to, to highlight the gym.
in our film. That's, that's so amazing. Um, I, I, yeah, I cried watching it. It was it, just seeing those moments. It felt like this really was the first time um, for, for so many of the girls. Um, Nicholas, I, as we think about where um, Eskimo Indian culture is right now, my question for you is, you know, these games are, and these sort of Olympics, as you say, they're rooted in traditional Eskimo culture. And I think it was described as pure Americana, um, connecting Western civilization with our ancestry. Where does it stand right now in the broader picture? You gave us this unbelievable insight and, and brought us to where it is for this particular community, but for the lower 48 of us, how would you describe it now? It's such a unique subject. Um, you know, it seems like people in the lower 48, when they hear the word Eskimo, you know, they think of people living in an igloo somewhere. Um, but realistically, you know, these are our people and, you know, they are Americans just like you and I, um, and they just choose to live in one of the most beautiful places in this country. Um, so my whole point was to try and just like open up the eyes of the common person and just say like, hey, look, you know, uh, Eskimos, Native Alaskans, you know, these are Americans as well. And they have a huge history um, that is really forgotten. Um, you know, in the 1950s, it, not very long ago was when um, we were forcing uh, nomadic Eskimos into settlements, you know, and, and women were being taken from their traditional village and brought to Fairbanks or Anchorage and put into Catholic school. You know, this, this isn't a hundred years ago. This is fairly modern. Um, and, you know, these are stories that came up as I was interviewing some of the elders. Um, it was just, just really mind blowing at what has happened up there and the fact that, you know, we're kind of oblivious to it. So I hope that the film was just kind of a little snippet into you know some of their traditions and like how exciting it can be and and how the people really rally around these uh these games nicholas one thing that also stood out to me was the physical pain of choosing to be an athlete in these games the knuckle hop the um the ear that the ear exercise that was i don't know if this is the right way to put it but was reminiscent of frostbite tolerance. Um, as you were making it, the pain really jumped off of the screen. It, it, it really like, it shocked me. Um, is that part of the, the, the goal here? As you were telling the story, how much did that pain element and that perseverance play into the way you told the story and the, what you wanted the, the viewer, the audience to take away? Uh, I, I think it, it, it's important to realize like it, it's it's ingrained in their culture. So for example, the knuckle hop is a technique used in seal hunting. So when a seal pokes his head up through the hole on the ice, the hunter would use the knuckle hop to pretend to be a seal. Um, and that's sort of where it came from. So for the person doing the game, it's it's more of this is what my ancestors did um, I'm continuing this culture and I'm going to show them that I'm the best at it. And I think that from a hunter gatherer, um, culture, you know, it's really important to show that you are the best you can provide for your, your family and your uh, community, you know, and that's really what it comes down to in these smaller communities where people live together, sort of in harmony, they're all looking out for each other. And, um, you know, that's something that a lot of us miss these days. We've kind of been civilized to death, I would say. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool to see just, you know, how people really uh, want to help each other and, you know, how sportsmanship was such a big part of the games. You had athletes giving tips to other athletes who, you know, were doing worse than them in a particular event. And I think that's really amazing in no other sport where you're competing against somebody are you trying to help the person you're competing against? So they really take pride in, uh, in just helping each other. Anjali, another 
character it felt like in the documentary in oil and water was the weather i i the drought i i thought it was this really important critical scary reality and i wanted to know from you when it comes from when it comes to climate change and weather patterns how much does that play into the future of that community and Chum Chum's abilities to continue her fight and that whole community's fight and the younger women who are, who are joining in to really make a difference? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've picked up on something. So in terms of background, I'm actually, um, before I became a filmmaker and a foreign correspondent and so on, I uh, actually was a climate scientist. So it's not, um, it's not strange that that kind of comes up in the films that I make. Um, but absolutely, like the, the unknowns or the, uh, the kind of knowns about the unknowns are, are going to impact those communities to such an extent, whether it's um, extreme floods or extreme droughts, um, whether it's locusts, which they've been dealing with for the last like five months. Um, these things are like the natural, natural variables that are becoming more and more extreme because of changing weather patterns and in more extreme weather patterns. And, um, and of course, when you have a, a company that's extracting a, a great deal of water to um, process oil and to do their, their company um, uh, mandate, that, that is at huge cost to the community. So already these are very stressed communities that have been used to walking extreme um, you know, uh, distances to be able to find pasture for their animals and find water. When you start kind of creating structure and making sure that people live in these little systems and stop moving with their animals and stop the, the, even the possibility of movement because of infrastructure that's been placed there, um, then that becomes, they become so much less resilient as a, as a community. So you're losing the built-in resilience that um, communities had naturally just because of the way that their communities were structured and the kind of nomadic idea of it and really making something that's stuck and reliant on a community. So you have like sitting ducks that, you know, not only if there's a drought, are they reliant on these water deliveries, which they could be pumped in? There could be so many other ways to make this sustainable. Um, and then in addition, if the company ever leaves or the company, um, or if there's a like an, an extreme weather event, there's that um, much more problem. So I think everything combined, um, if you take away the natural patterns and the natural resilience, and then you add on climate change, and then you add on infrastructure that creates reliance, it's just, um, it's just a potential for disaster. I think, you know, the entire world in 2020 has been looking and, and pausing and thinking about like, you know, how could we do better? How could our infrastructure be better? And I think that this is a moment to happen like all over the world where we think through these, these structures that have been created and what needs to happen in order for them to be sustainable and what voices need to be at the table for that to happen. Um, and undoubtedly i think that community voices in those conversations like they have to be there they have to take place and that's the only way that we're going to find sustainable solutions not only at a local level but at a global level i see all of you nodding your heads at anjali's statement on that front that that communities need to be part of the respective conversations in your films and i'm guessing um throughout throughout the world and i just wanted to say thank you i could talk to you guys about your films for hours longer but i am being told to wrap so i just wanted to thank you all kristen lapis of black feet boxing not invisible nicholas natal games of survival a culture preserved in ice and angela nair oil and water congratulations and thank you for all of the hard work and your entire teams for putting these together for us um i wish you all the best of luck and i can't wait for you guys to share this with everyone else thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.